What's up, party people? Welcome back to the Drew Dillman YouTube channel. We're at the USA Cycling Gravel Nationals. This is the second year it's ever happened. Last year, I was 13th place. Let's see what happened this year right now. The race is 131 miles, just under 6,000 feet of climbing in the rolling hills of Gehring, Nebraska. Right, me and Chase work off with attack number one of the day. This is our MO these days. I mean, Chase has got this reputation of, of this guy that wants to get an early break. And so if you haven't heard, me and him are teaming up for 2025, but we get a gap right here. We've got a pretty good sizable gap. And I'm like, dude, that was, that was easy. Uh, in, in the other races that we were doing like gravel worlds we tried really hard to get an early break and it just wouldn't happen and eventually the early break went an hour in but in this race all it took was one attack and we had a gap but just as quick as that gap had gone out it came back and as soon as we get caught michael garrison sends a flyer he gets a pretty sizable gap quite quickly and then not too long after that we see a bright yellow jersey come flying up the outside right here now that is a world tour ride colby simmons quinn simmons's little brother that's griffin easter a couple other riders dj dylan johnson toba norton glad and maybe one other rider are going to get into that early move now that was the counter attack to mine and chase's attack kind of a bummer that we set up that attack so five or six riders end up off the front with a pretty sizable gap. My GoPro actually stopped working. I had to do a battery swap, but in the meantime, here's what's happened. I'm looking for a bridge to get up to that, to that breakaway of six riders up the road. Now, Borselman, John Borselman, one other rider, and Chase Wark have all made their way off the front of the main group, so those three are chasing, and then, Brennan Wirtz attacks, myself and Nathan Spratt get on his wheel, and the three of us end up bridging across to the chase group. So now the chase group is seven strong riders all working together, and we're chasing down that front group of six riders off the front. That's 13 riders all together off the front of the main group, and most notably missing out of those 13 riders, Keegan Swenson, Russell Finsterwald, Daxton Mock, Lance Hayden. All those guys are still back in the main group. So then at some point we end up about a minute behind the lead group and about two minutes ahead of the main group, which is a pretty good spot to be in and it looks like we're going to merge up with that front group. All right, we're about to catch that lead group. They're only like 10, 15 seconds ahead of us. So me and John Borselman get in a little bit of a disagreement as to should we catch them or not. Borselman says we shouldn't catch them because then Tobin Orton Vlad, teammates of Keegan Swenson, will just sit on and the group won't work well together. And that's not good for a breakaway. I argue that we should catch them and keep working hard and just let Tobin sit on because Keegan, the strongest rider and defending champ of this race, is in the group two minutes behind us. And I want as big of a buffer on him as I can so that I can make it 
further into the race having being in front of him versus with him because if I'm with him he could attack me at any minute and drop me which is probably pretty realistic so we end up going with Borselman's strategy after Chase Wark chimes in and says yes he agrees that if there's a group of 13 riders that group might not work so well because the prime number for a good breakaway to stick and stay away all day is somewhere between like six and ten riders and 13 might be a little too much and so uh, the group dynamic would slow up and it would all come back together. But it doesn't really matter because just a few minutes later, we end up catching that lead group. And just as we catch that lead group, the main group catches us. And now the whole group is back together. And usually when this happens, the group may sit up because it's like, okay, we just did all that work. We caught the chase group. And so let's recover for a bit. So me and Chase were kind of on the same wavelength here. We're like, maybe we could roll off the front and take advantage of this. That didn't happen. And then just about a mile later, we hit this super sandy section. I was a little bit unaware of how bad the sand was in this short little section. So I'm pretty far back. It's chaos. I think that's Lance Haydick going OTB, which is kind of embarrassing because he's supposedly a pretty good cyclocross racer and cyclocross racers should know how to ride through the sand. Come on, Lance, what you doing, bud? And we're off and running. I had to get off and run because I just had nowhere to go in front of me. And the group is just shattered at this point. I mean, it's all single file. I mean, Keegan, I'm pretty sure, attacked through the sand. They were on mountain bike tires, which is somewhat of an advantage in the sandy section. So he's on the front just blitzing it right now. And I basically go from off the front to off the back within a few short minutes. Here I'm riding with Nathan Spratt, Finn Gullickson for just a few minutes, but eventually I can't even hold their wheel, and I end up in no man's land completely by myself, and basically coming to the conclusion, well, that's the end of my race. So we're 67 miles in here. I've been off the back for 20 miles. Groups have already come rolling by me, and I'm contemplating life. I'm thinking, why am I even at this race? All I can think about are my, my two little girls at home, how much... Uh, I could be at home playing with them right now, but instead I'm getting dropped from some silly bike, bike race that nobody's going to remember. I'm contemplating retiring. Masters groups and junior groups are catching me. Um, so it's a pretty rough day, but eventually I kind of come around and I'm like, all right, um, you know, I'll, I'll finish. I'll just roll in, whatever. Uh, I talked to a couple people. The moto rolls up to me and reminds me, hey, you can hop into a group, but you can't work with that group because you don't want to interfere with that race. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm just pedaling. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was pretty done. I'm rolling into the 90 mile aid. I got dropped about 50 miles in, so I had to ride about 40 miles pretty much by myself. Stopped and talked with a few people here and there. I didn't want to interfere with that race, so I let that whole group roll by me before the 90 mile aid. And at this point, uh, I'm pretty con convinced I'm not going to finish. Um, you're probably thinking, you wimp, why would you finish? Well, I was thinking to myself, if I was at home on a normal training ride, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't keep riding. I wouldn't have went out for another 40 miles if I felt this bad in a normal training ride. So I, I ended up thinking, all right, I'm probably going to do more harm than good, so I'm going to pull the plug and just get a ride home. And had I, had I finished, it would have taken me another three hours to do that last 40 miles it wouldn't have been fun it would have been miserable and it would have taken me even longer to recover from probably something that i should have already been recovering from anyways all right here are the full stats i ended up riding for about four and a half hours made it to that 90 mile aid 248 tss but that doesn't really matter what you want to know is how hard did you go for those first two hours when you were off the front and here are the stats it was about a 316 normalized power for two hours, which is pretty high for me. That's nearly 0.9 intensity factor for two hours. 146 TSS, and you're probably thinking, bro, you idiot. You just went out way too hard, and that's why you got dropped. And you wouldn't be wrong. But I also think that there may have been some other things at play here. First of all, I think maybe I was a hair overtrained. Gravel Worlds, a 150 mile gravel race that happened two weeks prior to this one, I didn't exactly recover for very long after that race. I kind of did that race and then as soon as I got home, I went right back to training and I trained pretty hard for the two weeks between Gravel Worlds and Gravel 
gnats without a big recovery block in there with my recovery week being between gravel gnats and schwammigan this week right now. So I may have went into gravel gnats a little overtrained and a little fatigued. Now I also think the altitude might have come into play and you might be laughing thinking you do this it was only at 4,000 feet well when you live at 400 feet 4,000 feet is somewhat of a difference and I think that maybe altitude was secretly at play for the bad sensations that I was feeling now I didn't bonk and I didn't have uh, stomach issues and so those are usually the two main reasons why you don't finish uh, a gravel race now I literally my legs did not feel good and I and I do think that yes I went pretty hard for those first two hours but my Garmin readiness score which I try really hard to ignore on days like this was at a negative 13 at the start of this race now, I don't know why that is and but that does clue me into like Yes, I think I was on an off day, a bad day. Now, the biggest upset about all of this is that Dylan Johnson, my arch nemesis slash good friend who I've been trying to beat for years, also had a really bad day. So if I had just been on a freaking normal day, I might have beat him. But because we both had a bad day on the same day, we I didn't beat him, which is kind of a bummer. So that's how it goes. I don't feel bad for not finishing because I think that was the right call. I'm already looking forward to the next race. I do want to say thanks for watching. If you liked it, you want to see more like this, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. This one, I want to give a shout out to Flow Formulas. And if you want to save 15% on your next Flow Formulas order, use code RADDADDIZZLE at checkout. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.